I'm Nicole. I'm Geraldine. I'm Lauren. And we are Doing, Doing the, the Damn, Damn thing. thing, an entrepreneurship talk show. Welcome to our latest episode of Doing the Damn Thing. Thank you so much again for joining us, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. All that good stuff. So today, we have Kathy Crumpy from Future State. You want to tell us a little bit about what Future State is? Yeah. Hi, uh, Future Stay is an Oakland-based management consulting company. We've been in business for over 30 years, all located here in the Bay Area, and we help clients realize uh, their future visions of the, their company. So whether they're going through a full-scale end-to-end business transformation, um, or whether they need to launch a new technology or product, get their products to market faster, we're here to help them from the people side of that transformation and transformation changes. I saw your guys' website, and it was a very clean website. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I'm like, Good. oh, I want to play It's a new out. website as of okay. this year. Okay. So. Good job. Yes. Whoever made yeah. that. I love it. So, Lauren was telling me that it is employee-owned. Yeah, we're employee-owned. So what made you guys want to be employee-owned? Yeah, well, we're what's called an ESOP, which stands for Employee Stock Ownership Plan, and it's a form of ownership where there is um, no single owner and we're not publicly traded, but basically all the employees, if they meet a certain criteria, become uh, participants in our Employee Stock Ownership Plan, and it allowed the owner of our company, Meryl Natchez, who founded the company in the early 80s, to transition the company when she retired to the employees rather than closing up shop, which mm -hmm. for those of us there at the time we're very excited about <laughs> about doing. So it is mainly women, Lauren was telling me that, that work there. Yeah, we, yeah. well, we're 80, of, of all the participants, 87% of the shares are held by women. Um, Shannon Atkins is our CEO, so, and myself, so we're the uh, women-led C-suite, mm -hmm. and um, our three board members are also women. So, although we, I just, for the record, do want to say, we like, all gender, yeah. <laughs> all races, so we're we're just uh, not diverse in kind of the opposite way of most yeah. companies. And how does that make it different? What is this like? Some of the things that you've been there for a long time, right? How long yeah. have you been there? I've been there for I think about sixteen out of twenty-two years. I started in the mid nineties, wow. um, and uh, uh, we, me and a lot of people are, are boomerang employees. So we've left and come back and left yeah. and come back because. We really, over the years, and this is a lot from our founder, Meryl, has kind of created this environment where we welcome people back and you can go off and explore and do things, work at other companies, I move to different countries, and, and then and come back and bring those experiences to help the company in your next stage of your career. So, um, I mean, for the employee own, owner, it's a nice way for everyone to feel engaged that they have a stake in the company, because yeah. they do. And what does that really mean? I mean, like, what exactly yeah. does that mean? And and yeah. how does that get set up and yeah, it is a complex scheme, for lack of a better word. Um, ESOPs are managed under the same uh, laws as your 401k, so the ERISA laws. So they are heavily governed, and then the, each company who sets it up, normally you have a, a lawyer that specializes in this and, and various um, advisors that will help you set your company up as, a, as an ESOP. And you can have ESOPs that are 100% owned, like we are, and then less owned uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So there's there's kind of a whole bunch of different ways, and then the ERISA laws govern so that it's equitable and fair. So you have to make sure that all of your employees have the same access to ownership. So it creates kind of a uh, quality. So we have a large uh, amount of our team members work with us on a project by project basis. They're consultants to deliver, and that's mm -hmm. helped us scale without having a high costs of yeah. employees. Um, but our project-based team members are also eligible for our ESOP. So anyone that is working for us as an employee that's on our payroll has the same eligibility requirements as someone that's a staff team member. Well, it's like really cool because in this world of consultants, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you feel like as a consultant, you don't get all like 
the bells and whistles, even yeah. if you are a consultant for like a year or more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really yeah. Cool. I mean, it, we have our consultants have access to medical benefits. They have the same access to 401k as our staff team members do. They have the same, follow the exact same rules for the, the ESOP. So, um, yeah, consulting can be a pretty lonely life sometimes. And one of the benefits that, you know, I've really worked hard for future state is for folks that want to be a consultant can be a consultant and but then when they're on a project for us they have a a network they have access to all of our tools and Mm -hmm. systems all of our support and all of our benefits and they come into your beautiful office yeah just down the road (laughs) with a wonderful view yeah Yeah. in downtown oakland what are the qualities of the people or the consultants or staff people that you look for well, what, you know, as a, as a consultant, I think for all consultants, and we talked, you, you know, we were talking about entrepreneurship, right? It's some of those drives that you see, like you have to have your get up and go. You're, it's, you're depending on yourself and your skills and your experiences. And so you have to bring, you know, the confidence and the trust uh, and the experience to do that and your network too. And Future State, because we've been in business for so long here in the Bay Area, I think we can provide a lot of that. So if someone maybe hasn't tried consulting, maybe they've been an internal consultant at a mm-hmm. corporation and they want to give consulting a go, it's a safe place, you know, to land and, and, and to try that. So our consultants, what our clients tell us, <laughs> make us different is we show up as real people Mm -hmm. so we show up not as cookie cutters most of our consultants have 10 to 20 years of experience so they're bringing lots of expertise they um, are we have a set of guiding principles which Mm -hmm. is different than other consulting companies it's around applying empathy and staying in inquiry um, and listening so that's really kind of where we start from is those more human centered do you think that it has any connection with the like predominant female led organization yeah that's that's interesting (laughs) probably (laughs) so I mean I'm down you know our founder Mary was like the ultimate yeah. entrepreneur, right? Yeah. She came, she got into this business out of trying to provide an income for her family, right? Mm-hmm. And was like, I want to have control over it. I oh. want to do what I want to do, which is most entrepreneurs take that leap because they have a different idea. They want to do something and they want to have control over their destiny, mm-hmm. right? And they have the gumption and and will to, you know, will to do it. So she stood up the company, which was called Tech Pros when we founded it, out of her garage in Lafayette. <laughs> and it grew, you know, it grew from there. And now we're, you know, a $16 million company with anywhere between 70 and 100 employees working with most of the Fortune 500 companies with presence here in the Bay Area. That's so awesome. So, yeah, it started with one woman, one idea, getting the right people together and keeping that entrepreneurial spirit as we grew and shifted and changes because there's a lot of consulting companies out there. Yeah. We have a lot of competition. It's such a great example of how anything's possible. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times we'll dream and say this or that. We, we'd like to do that. And some people will just think, oh, no, I could never do that or that will never happen. I'll just mm-hmm. have my company stay really small. Yeah. I have a beautiful office at the top, well, close to the top of a... <laughs> In the middle. <laughs> We're not quite We're not up to with. the top. I looked at the top and I got the, I got the estimate for the broker. I'm like, lower. <laughs> Stop. Perfect view. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, what was the um, what's the the founder's name again? Meryl Natchez. Meryl. Yeah. So, what was Meryl's vision when she started? At, you say she just just to provide for her family, but clearly her vision grew, and you were there yeah. for a good portion of that. And yeah. um, at the beginning, well, if you start four years into it, you said? Uh, about ten years. Ten into years it, into yeah. it. At that point, where were they? And yeah. do you know much about like her decision to how she did she grew and? Yeah, I mean, she grew through networking. Connect- Connections and she grew through people. I mean, some of the people that worked on our very first project, I'm, I'm still in touch with. And oh, cool. so people that I worked with in the, you know, in the mid '90s and that even worked with Meryl before I worked there, are still in in touch. So um, one of our board members, Lynette Phillips, who's now been with the company for 22 years. Mm. Um, you know, we kind of keep this rich history of staying in contact and, you know, again, as I mentioned, leaving and, and coming back. So those relationships have been important from the very, very beginning. Um, when I started the company in the mid-90s, we were a million-dollar company, which for a single entrepreneur in the, that time yeah. is, is really substantial. Yeah. And um, the second 
maybe the second week, first or second week I was there, we won a contract with the state of California for a million dollars. So that first you week, like, doubled. Look at you, double. I know, exactly. I'm like, I just had to walk through the door. No, it was, it was hard earned, but it was instant for me. And I tell this to our team members because my manager at the time said, change is good, change is everything, change is important. And now even when we look at where we're at now, we're always having to change and adjust to the market. Our clients are having to change and adjust to the market. As an entrepreneur, you cannot stay stagnant. You can't be like, hey, I just landed this contact, you know, this, this client, this project, whew, I did, you know, mm-hmm. you're, it's, it's constant. And so mm-hmm. that was ingrained into me very early on. And I see sometimes people struggle with that of evolution and being able to shift and pivot and, and it's hard. I know it's hard, but it is so critical to any business of any size. I mean, you look at you know companies that didn't pivot, like Kodak. Yeah, right? yeah. they went away. Classic story, right? <laughs> companies that are pivoting to SaaS, like whoever can get to their SaaS model first wins. You know, you look at Amazon. I mean, like they are pivoting so fast. Who would have ever expected? you know, an online book seller yeah. to turn into this global <laughs> behemoth. But finance. that's, they're always looking for how do we, you know, how do we add on? How do we shift? How do we adjust? And so for me, that was a really kind of pivotal moment in my career of like, it's always going to change. You always have to stay one step ahead and be prepared and move fast and take every opportunity that you have. That's some awesome for advice for entrepreneurs, for everybody, and yeah. especially, I think, entrepreneurs. That's, like, a huge deal. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm curious because when we think about, like, Fortune 500 companies, um, I definitely don't think entrepreneurship. I think that's, like, right outside the realm. But I'm yeah. curious to know if you've had the opportunity to work with some of the people that were entrepreneurs that became these corporations. Yeah. Kind of like your boss, but yeah. I mean, within that that realm. Yeah, that, cer- certainly. I mean, I don't have personal relationships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but what I see in our clients, right? I do see people in Fortune 500 companies that demonstrate a lot of entrepreneurial. Um, uh, characteristics and that do want to make a difference Mm -hmm. and then you can clearly tell some people are like okay they're gonna be here for their career and and they're kind of just you know going along but um, I mean I think everyone whether you work at a large company or small company you have to have that mentality for your career now because people don't stay in jobs or full-time anymore I mean we're actually unusual that we have lots of people that have been with us for multiple decades right and it's actually we have to shift to be like if someone is only with us for two years we're like oh what did we do wrong they weren't here for very long right but you know at the same time for two years in a company that's yeah that's a like that's a long twice time. the average yeah. now yeah. that's like retirement age yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> so like, yeah recently some people um left my husband's company or not his company, the company he works at. But it was it was that mentality. I'm like, oh, they've been here for three years. Of course, right? they need to move on, right? <laughs> and you just have that mentality of like a few years and then you move on. So yeah. it, is dif- it is different that yeah. a lot of people stay at your company for such a long time. Well, that's yeah. a testament clearly of relationship building because yes. I think the, the trend of moving from like, primarily you hear about it in the tech industry and around mm-hmm. San Francisco for sure where people stay and then they get poached like, mm-hmm. you know, from the last person that left and went to another one. And a lot of that's just about more money really Mm -hmm. whereas like staying with a company where you feel like and that's even you know a thing to think about as an entrepreneur of what kind of culture do you want to build within your company and what how do you make people feel like they're family and and Mm -hmm. have ownership clearly like the um -hmm. the ESOP is one of the most important things right that I mean you guys are all really awesome people so also that but (laughs) but I mean I would definitely be more likely to stay in a place (laughs) In a place where I'm I'm given a portion of the proceeds. Mm -hmm. Does that work like they give it to you at the end of the year? Yeah, it's a little more complicated than than that. Um, But, you you know, you become eligible each year, and we do a valuation. So it's also good for us as a business because we can see how we're stacking up. You know, a lot of private companies, you don't have really any outside perspective on how well you're maturing as a business, what you're doing, how you're ranked against other companies performing in your field. So it's also nice because it gives us good business intelligence to help us 
run the business and it also kind of says okay the company is worth x amount and then it's you know it's it's divided up in various in various ways um, and then you either get shares or you get cash if there aren't shares available so there's certainly some limitations to ESOP um, it is not uh, I would only recommend it if you're uh, you know a fairly mature company and you have some really good financial and legal advice um, and it takes time and it takes time to manage it too so things that we didn't have to do as a business we now have to do and it takes time to administer it um, so as you grow and scale your business you also have to remember that like oh now you have to have HR functions and finance functions and operations where it's like mm-hmm. used to be like hey remember we, we just got that proposal out the yeah. door we delivered it <laughs> yeah. that was something remember those good old days <laughs> um, you know I tell my team I was like my job as the COO is to make sure we're here for another 32 years I wake up every day and say so a lot of it's more risk mitigation mm-hmm. when I started recruiting it was just about the, you know doing the, the work and it still is but I also have this very big purview of how do I make sure the company will be here? How do I make sure that our employees are protected? And um, some of that isn't the super sexy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like, you know, it's like, oh, someone has to do that. I'm like, yeah, someone has to do that because our laws are getting more complicated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even with the gig economy, we're so far behind um, in our legal system of being able to support mm-hmm. small business entrepreneurs and the gig economy that it's hard Mm -hmm. for a company our size to stay um, competitive with less resources than larger companies do. Mm -hmm. And I think all entrepreneurs will kind of struggle that you'll have this tipping point, right? Where it was just you and now it's a couple people Mm -hmm. that you're like Mm -hmm. partners in crime, you're in it to win it. And then you're like, okay, now I'm going to bring someone else into the fold and then someone else, right? And then you're like, oh, I have to follow laws, right? There's like the things I have to do, like laws. I still remind my team, I'm like, I don't make some of this stuff up. Yeah, definitely not. It would make my job a lot easier sometimes. But Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting to think about for entrepreneurs. And, you know, I saw Meryl and we struggled with ourselves because we're so still have that entrepreneurial spirit of like, we just want to go. We just want to do things Mm -hmm. and build things. It's like, where is that tipping point for you in your company? Yeah. to build business maturity versus your what you go to market with. So it sounds like you you've been well you've been with them for a long time. You've been part of I mean you doubled their growth in a week. So <laughs> <laughs> Meryl, I didn't, that, that was all you. <laughs> um, and so uh, what what do you consider yourself an entrepreneur and you have that entrepreneurship yeah. mindset? You know, I I didn't ever actually consider myself an entrepreneur, but I definitely think I have that mindset. Um, I have the have this drive, this inner drive to be successful and work with people I like to work with and be in just a very high sense of ownership. And I think for entrepreneurs, right, like if you don't do it, no one else will. And so I always come to the table with that. When someone says, oh, we should, I'm like, okay, let, who, who's the we here? Like, <laughs> I, said, I don't have people or money under my desk, so let's talk about it. If we're going to do this, yeah. it's us, and we, you know, gotta, you know, we're by the bootstraps company. We don't have outside funding, don't have investors. We have, you know, we have a line of credit if we need it, but, like, we're self-funded, so if something is not going mm-hmm. south it's it's us or something's going great it's us and that's the benefit of that employee ownership too is there's very few um, investment opportunities that people have you know owning your own business is one um, you know blood sweat and tears on your property is another <laughs> but you know if you invest in a mutual fund you can't like go over and make sure coca-cola is doing a good job mm-hmm. or like buy yeah. so much product that it's gonna like you just don't it. have any influence right? <laughs> like i'm just gonna keep drinking coke and <laughs> beat out pepsi and then you look at like oh i have both coke and pepsi and right? cancer <laughs> yeah i can't yeah, 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 cancer from diabetes. <laughs> yeah exactly so what do you do it's like so if you run your own business you see how that does and the next best thing i think is an employee-owned company because even if you don't maybe not own shares right away you know that what you're doing is so valuable every single person in our company is high value like that everyone has to be performing full force for us to 
to be successful or has an yeah. impact. That's, that's awesome because no, sorry, no, no. <laughs> uh, that's awesome because then as a even at the consultant level, you know that there's a possible future that mm -hmm. you can be stepping into. Mm -hmm. as an yeah, owner. future. Yeah, state. and I mean, I, yeah, it's their <laughs> future state. <laughs> you know, when I do all my offboarding interviews, it always pains me if someone you know, it's people generally aren't leaving because they didn't want to work with us. Sometimes, you know, they find higher paid jobs mm -hmm. and, you know, we're probably not the highest paying <laughs> consulting firm out there. So there's definitely, you know, more money. Probably not the lowest. And not the lowest. <laughs> I would yeah, imagine. Not the lowest. But, you know, they'll leave for, for money. But, you know, there a lot of times people just say, like, I just wish there were more work, right? So we're mm. trying to always generate more leads and opportunities because people want to stay working with us. Mm. And if I can find all those opportunities, there's lots of people that would, you know, rather work for us than a larger consulting firm because of the benefits and the people and the, the network that we provide. And that, that feels really good. Yeah. I feel even better if I could keep them all working. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to, you know, one of the, the first conversation you and I had was because I was really curious about the fact of this um, employee-owned mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. system. And um, I think it's really awesome, especially, like, I feel like it's a conversation that's now starting to be had in the mm -hmm. world, but it's, like, not fully understood. Like, there's a few places in Oakland and Berkeley, bakeries and, yeah. you know, uh, grocery they stores. It's like a co-op model is a yeah. popular, mm -hmm. popular And there's, model. I mean, I guess probably not the structure is similar, but the mm -hmm. idea yeah. of, like, everybody has some part, has the ability to have some ownership. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of people believe that that's how the world's going to be saved, is mm -hmm. through models like that where people have more equity in their lives and we can bring it down into, like, you know, co-op communities where people can, you know, they're all have a stake in what's in it. And I think it just means that it feels to me like it would create a, a respect, more respectful environment. And, um, yeah, I was really disappointed when you told me it was really a lot of work to do that. <laughs> I'm like, can, can we all like, say, everyone, you I don't guess? Know, turn, turn you totally off, but, like, you know, it's good for you know for those circumstances mm -hmm. but, but there's lots of other like yeah. co-op models are much easier can you do that for consulting firms could you do a co-op I, I, I don't know okay I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I, I give no financial or legal know. advice <laughs> no no disclaimer <laughs> but I, I've just been trying like yeah. I've been curious and like yeah. not really diving into a lot of research but I have done research yeah. here and there about different ways so well, also I mean, just getting to understand yeah. the difference I mean in the, the words. other business model is the B Corp which we're also a certified B Corp and that is you know a great way for companies to really identify with a common set of values that is you know is known so you look at you know Patagonia like we won't have the press news and and you know holding our you know our profits for days and going to make the same impact that Patagonia is going to make but having say that you know we are a certified B Corp we've gone through all the um the questionnaires and the, and the interviews, but what they're looking at is, you know, I guess the the triple bottom line is a little outdated way of, of saying it. I've been I've been told by my oh, impact okay. friends, like, <laughs> but um, that's so yeah, 2011. It's, yeah, it's, it, it, it's old school, but I'm kind of old school in this space. But really looking at your shareholders, right? And for us, because our biggest shareholders is our employee. Mm -hmm. So Shannon and I always, you know, and Shannon talks about this a lot too. You know, she'll say, you know, every day I think about how do I help our you know our stakeholders in our organization she's like and it's easy because our employees yeah. right so yeah. we're not competing with you know a public board and public shareholders and our employees and our clients right it's our it's our clients and our employees and those are two major shareholders and then when we think about from the b corp perspective every business decision are we working with local businesses are we you know giving back are we doing working for our community are we being kind to the environment Environment and actually making business decisions that support that, right? Before we were a B Corp, we're like, wow, this really aligns. It'll, you know, but even still, we've made, we've changed a lot of our vendors to be more local, um, be more women owned, be more diversity awesome. ownership. Where before we're like, oh yeah, just order that paper from Office Max. <laughs> now we'll order it from another B Corp. Mm -hmm. And that makes a difference. So I think 
how businesses run to and even some of the like the operational things really makes a difference and it contributes to the culture. You do a lot of um, putting together reports and stuff, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just wondering, like, so you're a B Corp, you're ESOP, you also, I think, are one of the best places to work in the Bay Area. You're on that list, right? We are not on that list. Oh, you're not? We but want that's, to be on that list. Have you we try every for? year. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> that's too bad. Vote for them. <laughs> but that takes a lot of paperwork, too. Mm-hmm. And then what other kind of certificate? Uh, or? We are a um, certified women um women-owned business, and that takes a lot of paperwork, yeah. uh, too. And then we do we do get on a lot of diversity supplier lists, so um, large Fortune 500 companies will have mm. um, diversity supplier lists, and that takes more paperwork. It takes a lot. We it tried takes a, to do that. Yeah, yeah it's, it you know, <laughs> and this is part of the thing. It's like, why is it so hard to do yeah. good? Do you have to have literally another a separate position just to fill yeah. out all the paperwork yeah. for all of that stuff? Yeah, some t- some sometimes we do. Some years mm-hmm. we really get a, a bug, and we'll get and then you know if you want to be you know in, on government lists as a diversity supplier too. So far, unfortunately, it hasn't resulted in significant business for us recently. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. it's you know it's disappointing because a lot of. Yeah, uh, companies will say like yeah we really believe in you know having diverse vendors and and they have these programs that don't go anywhere mm-hmm. and it's 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 really disappointing and I would yeah. like to see corporate America change in that way we do a lot some of our best clients <laughs> fall into that bucket but they're missing amazing oppor- you know amazing opportunities with entrepreneurs and women and um uh, racial diversity it's it's really and you know now we're getting in, into the space of you know neural and uh, learning uh, diversities and mm-hmm. and so I think there's just so much opportunity that um, uh, they're trying to make it so easy to purchase things that yeah. they make it hard to, you know, for everybody else and there uh, there's I think a lot of opportunities there yeah mm-hmm. I think that's what Geraldine and I found when we were doing that right like yeah the, we were um, we had the women business the Alameda County women mm-hmm. um, and minority owned yeah, yeah minority owned business and yeah there was like one was saying tons of paperwork a lot of different steps that you have to follow and then at the end you may or oftentimes may not get the yeah <laughs> the project. well and then you have to go yeah then you, there's a whole another process of like actually applying yeah. and the way you have to send it yeah. through we were we actually hired a coach to work with us on it Mm -hmm. and just like eventually realize you know we don't have time for all of this we are a small business we can't Mm -hmm. we don't have time so Mm -hmm. the RFP process is cumbersome and we have a sales enablement team and um, you know we used to do a lot more government work um, previously at some periods of time we had whole proposal teams and you have to have people that are really um, fast and skilled. Like yeah. We have all the documentation. So now when RFP comes in, you just like mm-hmm. we have yeah, we can, you know, That's and then good. yeah. So it, but still, I mean, sometimes I'm like, hey, this took a picture of this one box, and this was about a year ago. I was like, this is what a million dollar proposal looks like. I mean, it was literally wow. a, like all the stuff they wow. wanted, and it didn't make it. We did not win it. Yeah, and they didn't even end up doing the project. Oh. <laughs> They're like, psych. <laughs> Like, no, they, they were looking through all the boxes of proposals, and they were like, this is yeah. too much. Yeah, they can't even read it. Yeah. 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 So you have to be really careful with your time, right, and yeah. determine, like, what do you say no to, mm-hmm. right? So before I was talking about all those being opportunistic and jumping at things, um, it's also being opportunistic what you say no to and mm-hmm. really making sure you're saying you know, no to those things that are just going to be giant time sucks. So yeah. we came up with criteria of, like, Great. Do you know the buyer? Have you been able to have a conversation? Have they bought with us before? Like, so that we are making sure that when we're investing in the sales process, we we get into what we call is column A. Yeah. <laughs> of like, you know, you're going to be their top one to three peeps. Yeah. 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 So thank you, Kathy, so yeah. much. You gave us an array of information. <laughs> I love it. So is there any final... T- um, Things that you want to talk about future state to the audience, like how they can reach you or what? Yeah. <laughs> if 
why they should reach out to you? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, as we mentioned, we're here in Oakland. We are at www.futurestate.com, also on LinkedIn and also on Facebook. So, like us and share. Um, please reach out to myself directly as well. Happy to continue the conversation. And if you are um, interested in being a consultant with us, it's recruiting at futurestate.com, and we're always looking for project managers, change managers, communication specialists, business process consultants that want to make a difference um, for the work that we do with our clients. And then if you want to hire us, of course, you know, uh, info at futurestate.com. We're happy to help you through your business transformation needs. Yes, and all that information will be in the description box below as usual. So again, thank you guys so much for joining us. Don't forget to hit the red button that says subscribe and ring that bell and we will see you next week. Bye. 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 <laughs>